Hey, it's Dan Melnick. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Zing, and I'm proud to be a sponsor of this podcast. So please check us out today as we can help fuel your business growth. MyZing.io. Thank you. Hey, Sai, how are you today? Great, sir. How are you doing? I'm hanging in there. It's a Friday, so I'm ready uh, to relax this weekend. Thank you very much, Firstly, uh, uh, Thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to interview you for my YouTube channel and podcast and for my channels. Oh, it's my pleasure. Absolutely. So I've gone through your profile. I can see you're doing a lot of work. So I thought to tell about your work to my audience. So can you please introduce yourself to my audience? I'm sorry. Ask me that one more time. Uh, I thought to tell about your work uh, uh, to my audience. Can you please introduce yourself to my audience? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so my name is Kevin Griffin. I'm a independent software consultant uh, based out of Chesapeake, Virginia in the United States. Um, I have been primarily working with .NET and Azure for the past decade and more. Uh, I work with a variety of small to medium sized businesses um, all the way up to uh, Fortune 50 companies. Uh, just helping come in and architect and build business software. Um, in addition to that, I'm a Microsoft MVP, so highly focused on the .NET stack and uh, building solutions in Azure. Uh, I run multiple uh, meetups in my area and various conferences. And yeah, that's a that's, that's probably a good place to, to stop. Oh, and I have a podcast called the Multi-Threaded Income Podcast where I talk to developers about personal finance and how to earn money doing side work as a software technologist. So uh, you're from? Uh, you're basically Sorry. from? Uh, you're basically from? I'm uh, I'm from uh, Virginia in the States. So, so you are into technology from a long time? For a long time, yes. Uh, uh, almost 20 years. So, do you remember where you started and uh, how your technology journey started? Oh, sure do. Uh, I got my first computer when I was, I was maybe 10 years old. And this is back in the early 90s. And uh, we weren't allowed to touch it. It was a very expensive toy but I wasn't allowed to touch it because it was very expensive. And my parent, my dad was in the U S Navy and he left on deployment for a couple months. And while he was gone, I decided to play around on the very expensive toy. And back then we didn't have the internet. We just had books at the library. So I checked out a couple books on just learning things on the computer. And one of the books I picked up was, uh, on a language called QBasic. And QBasic was kind of my forte into uh, software development for the first time. And did that for months and months and really wanted to learn more. And back then, we didn't have any resources. There were no resources for kids trying to learn how to write software. And so I'd, finding what I could at the library and eventually uh, finding classes in high school and in college or university um, and just try to learn as much as possible. Got my first programming job out of college working for a company called Symantec, um, building uh, software for the Norton antivirus and security suite. Uh, and after that, I moved on to doing some consulting with a consulting company and then eventually just went out on my own as an independent consultant. So from then till now, uh, you are into uh, independent consultant and you are doing uh, your own contribution. That's right. I I didn't. I had a good opportunity to go work on a contract, and I decided to quit my job, go independent, and that was 13 years ago uh, that I made that jump, and I've had no reason to go back. So it's been good. So what are your technology skills? Uh, I can understand you're into .NET and Azure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I try to niche as much as possible 
on the .NET stack um, and building systems for Microsoft Azure. Uh, but I've done a fair amount of web development with uh, various technologies. Uh, I've done it all, Vue, React, Angular. Um, I even remember building applications back in the jQuery days and doing all the work by hand, uh, work with a variety of databases. I don't let technology, I don't really categorize myself as, uh, I am su not super strict into one technology. I love my .NET, I love my Azure, but I don't let that limit what technology I pick up. I try to be a jack of all trades. So if it's something that's going to solve my problem, it's a direction I'm going to go. And I, I find that's made me pretty successful uh, up to this point. So what kind of businesses that you uh, held before and uh, do you remember the the best one, the challenging one? Oh, I've had a lot of challenging ones. Uh, so I've done work with uh, some military contracts. I built a, a database system for the U.S. Air Force um, to manage some of their training uh, many years ago. Uh, I've done work with Harley Davidson to help them with some of their quality assurance. Uh, I've built uh, scholarship systems for for nonprofits to help manage kids looking for scholarships in in um, in high school. I've currently working with a company called Shows on Sale, and we build tools to help ticket brokers. So anyone out there that buys and resells tickets to sporting events and concerts and uh, events like that, uh, we build data analysis software for uh, for those folks. Um, but I try not to limit myself to one particular industry. Uh, one of my best skills is being able to go in rapidly learn what I need to know about the various industry that I'm, I'm going into and then helping them solve their business problems with software. So you are into .NET and Azure. So what is that motivation that is driving you to be in it? And what is that fascination? That passion? The, the fascination is that I can do a lot of work in a short amount of time. Uh, there's something to be said for maturity in a in a stack uh net just saying that in a crowd of people you expect dot net to be around for a very long time um the larger the business they are not wanting to rewrite their software every year or two and we see a lot of cases with a lot of different tech stacks where things start start off good and they hit this high point and then they eventually die down or they go away altogether. And companies that build their applications on these different stacks usually have to rewrite or maintain uh, these systems themselves for a long period of time. We've found with .NET, just something I've written 10 years ago can still be in production today and still is uh, something that can be managed, and we don't have to rewrite those systems every year or two. Um, it's actually a funny story. I just got off a call a couple of days ago with a, a potential customer who has a system that I wrote initially 13 years ago at a different company, and that software is still in production today, and they're asking me to take over the contract for <laughs> because I am – the person that wrote it initially a long time ago, and it's been managed over all this time. So that's kind of the nice thing about saying I'm on the .NET stack, I'm, on, I'm deploying to Azure, is that there's this, this sense of just maturity to it. It's not going to go anywhere. And you can feel safe devoting tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars or more to building software, knowing that that investment is going to last for the next 10, 15 years. Uh, and I find a lot of larger companies want to make that investment in their software systems. They don't want to have to try to rewrite things every uh, year or two. So being an individual contributor and helping different businesses, which belongs to different industries from long time and uh, uh, working in Microsoft uh, tech stack. So what is that thing which is making you to work on Microsoft products and services? 
Uh, a lot of that is just personal preference. Um, I did a lot of jumping around different tech stacks earlier in my career, and I was always drawn back to the Microsoft stack. Um, Microsoft stack is built by developers for developers. It is drastically more developer friendly than any other system I've ever worked in. Um, the, from the tooling to the, uh, software development environments to just the support down the line. It's more developer friendly and it's not trying to, other things are a little bit more hostile. Uh, they, they try to solve a lot of big problems very quickly. They don't think about them and it takes time for these different systems to mature. Um, and that's not to say that there aren't other mature systems out there. And I could rattle off, uh, half a dozen in just a couple of minutes. But I find for personal preference, coming back to the .NET community is where where I want to be. And I'm at the point in my career where it's just easier to stay focused in one niche than to try to jump around for for every different project. And uh, what is the difference and the change that you observed uh, working for, uh, you know, uh, military business or uh, or, or Harley Davidson or, or other businesses that you work for, uh, writing yeah. software for them? Uh, every business is slightly different. The larger the business, the more uh, red tape and just hoops you have to jump through. Um, the military in particular, you when I worked on a military contract, there was there was a high expectation of how things were going to be done by certain times in certain ways. And it wasn't very conducive to writing software. Software is, it's a very unknown process. It's not like doing real engineering. It's, it's something where you get started and you have the best intentions. You can have a plan, but then things ultimately go wrong and issues occur and things come up. Uh, military doesn't like that when that, when that happens. They want everything by the book. You have a deadline. We want you to meet your deadline, which is funny because historically, like the military never hits anything on time. And I don't know why they had that expectation of me, but, um, I really prefer working with small businesses. So the, like the customer I have right now, uh, we, I would consider them a small business, but they're doing fairly well for themselves. But the nice thing is I'm communicating directly with the owners of the company and they are more human than the larger companies where I'm talking to a manager who talks to a manager who talks to a manager. And when you have this ladder of responsibility, it's really difficult to get answers to your questions. It's difficult to uh, notify when when you need to change direction. Uh, and they're always asking for updates down the line. So the manager's manager's manager wants to know what's going on. And it's just easier to be one step removed from the person that's making the decisions. And more importantly, the person who has the money to, to pay you for the work you're doing. So how do you look at yourself uh, uh, when you compare yourself when uh, 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 you starting uh, studying about computers, knowing about our computers, uh, you know, with the computer that your father bought, and mm-hmm. uh, with the with the day with the personality that you have as a technology expert. So, how do you define yourself? This uh, technology growth and the evolution that you saw in your entire career, the technology evolution. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I think the evolution really came from I had a fascination with building things. And I I like to say if I didn't necessarily go into the direction of software development, I probably would have ended up in a trade of some sort. So like a traditional engineering position um, or some sort of trade like engineering or I'm sorry, uh, being an electrician or a plumber um, or something building something out with my hands. Um, I love the process of starting with nothing and then having to to develop something by the end. And I still do that in my personal time now. When I'm not writing software, I'm doing work around the house. I do woodworking, all like 
all that good stuff. I love working on my own cars. It's just the, the tinkerer in me. Uh, software development is really conducive to that because it's software. It's easy to change and manipulate and to test and to play around without really incurring any cost. And it's nice to be able to just mess around with different ideas. And we are accelerating in technology faster today than I think we have in the the past 20 years. There, there used to be a time I remember where you would learn something and that knowledge was good for at least a year and a half. And today you have to just be a rapid learner, uh, picking up new, new text, uh, stacks every day to, because it's just going to keep moving. Like AI is a great example. Uh, AI, no one was really talking about it a year ago and now it's in everything. And we have, we have had to rapidly learn where the technology is going and then try to keep up with it. And then there's this percentage of people that are moving uh, beyond it. And uh, what made you to be uh, consecutively be a Microsoft MVP? Uh, so the Microsoft MVP isn't something you just get to decide to be. You have to be nominated by your peers to um, to receive the reward. Um, and that's what it is. It's an award given by Microsoft to people in the community who are active participants. They're out there just teaching everything they know. They're helping members of their community. Uh, from very early days of my career, I've been very active in uh, speaking, uh, public speaking and teaching everything that I know, because there have been countless number of people who have helped me personally just through teaching everything that they know. And we find in the software development community that we're just this tight knit group that just wants to teach and help others be successful. Um, I don't know very many greedy software developers. We're all trying to just teach every, everything we know. Um, so the MVP award comes from that idea of going out and teaching what I know. And it doesn't even necessarily need to be Microsoft software. I mean, that helps. But 14, 14 15 years ago now, uh, some peers of mine recognized the work I was trying to do in the community and submitted my name for uh, nomination and I was awarded. And every year since I've been back in the system for renewal and I've just continued to receive the reward for the past 14 years. Uh, and fingers crossed, I, I get it again in uh, what, four months. That's great. And uh, how you are able to be good in uh, communicating with computers being a software developer and also being successful communicating with human beings, talking with business owners. So two different communication skills that you they are. Uh, it's not easy. It's a skill I've had to grow over uh, two decades. Um, there was a time 20 years ago I would have never gotten up in front of a crowd. I would never have done a talk. And if it I had an experience early in my career where I was laid off from a job. And I I had this sense of that there's no such thing as job security. And if I was going to have job security, I would really have to build my own job security. And that's why I ended up going independent um, many years ago was that if I was going to work and support my family, I needed to make sure I built the skills necessary to to accomplish that. A big part of that is people skills and just being able to relate to a person, have a conversation with a person. And the, especially from a from business standpoint, I think that's what makes me a successful consultant is I can s understand and speak the business part of it as well as the technology part of it and translate the two. Uh, because the majority of the clients I work with aren't technology people. They they don't understand and they don't really care what the technology is doing. They just want their problem solved and they want their business to be able to earn money. So I can come in, empathize with that, and then build the software that does all the work for them. And that's what most con software consultants do. 
but the you know building that rapport with people that's taken just years and years and years of practice uh and the public speaking i do the only reason i ever got into that was because someone pushed me and said kevin we think you would do a good job doing a talk why don't you put a talk together and i did my first talk back in 2007 and i've been hooked ever since it's been a lot of fun to get up in front of uh big crowds and small crowds so i've spoken to as little as one person and to as many as like four or five hundred people so as you said uh just now uh, most of the business owners who belongs to different industries are not much into technology they don't know how technology works but as a technologist as a person who developed the technology skill set uh, you are communicating and telling them in a language that they can understand uh, you are trying to relate them giving different examples and trying to uh, uh, trying to help them with the technology uh, products and services so how you are able to communicate uh, with these business leaders and how you make them you know make things done it's <laughs> It's a lot of just letting them talk. Um, so much of being a good communicator is listening. It's not, it's not trying to speak or command the conversation. It's asking them to, uh, explain what it is that they do. And then I, I find with a lot of people, they get excited when you ask them questions about themselves. Um, and the, I can give you an example for, say, the work I did for Harley Davidson a long, long time ago. Uh, the person I was working directly with was solely in charge of managing the systems for quality assurance in Harley Davidson and asking him to explain the, the processes that they built or time. He got excited about it because those are the things that he controlled and he was, he was excited about it. And. Then you get to ask this really fun question of, all right, well, you've explained to me how it works now. What would make it better? And this has always been the nice part about software is we don't build software to change how a business works. We, um, we build software to complement the business. And, uh, for example, when I was chatting with Harley Davidson, they said, here's, here's our process. It'd be easier if we had ways to do X, Y, and Z. And he would give me all these different examples and we would build a plan to try to fix that with software. And a lot of it's prototyping and just running through examples. And, uh, there's this period of time where I understand maybe 10% of the big picture and just being a person that asks a lot of questions, you start filling in the gaps along the way. Eventually, you get to a point where you can speak the language of the person that you're working for. And that's that's a really great place to be because you can speak in their language. You can use their words and their phrases and they know exactly what you mean. And they can talk back to you in their words and phrases, um, communicating what needs to change or answering the questions that you might have. Um, so it there there's. There's a lot of books out there on this topic. Just um, Dale Carnegie, um, you know, how to uh, win and influence people. Like that's a great read. It's just about listening and then trying to mimic what you're hearing and being able to do that efficiently and effectively uh, takes time. And but once you master it, you can really walk into any situation and command the conversation and leave with a good rapport with whoever you're you're talking to. So one of the examples that you gave is uh, the company that you worked for 13 years ago is trying to ask your help again. In, yeah. uh, relating to that, I have a question. Like you have, you have been in uh, technology from a long time, more than 20 years. You saw the evolution. You saw the constant change that happened. It can be .NET or it can be Azure, the cloud service. So you saw you know, how uh, these technology products and services are helping different businesses that you work for or other businesses in other other countries also. So 
what you understood in this complete uh, experience in your lifetime technology experience how this technology uh, is helping humanity how is it helping humanity that's that's a big question i don't know if i'm fully qualified to answer but i think what technology does best is technology steps in for the places that a human would nec- would typically have to do by hand and if we look at we'd have to pick a couple examples i think uh motor vehicles is probably a good place to to start uh or at least kind of show some of this concept if we look back at cars from 20 years ago so i drive a, a 1999 Ford Ranger. It's a small utility pickup truck. It has no bells and whistles. It's, it's just a vehicle that gets me from one place to another. And you compare that with a vehicle that you could buy right now, brand brand new, 2024. The difference is, the, the, it's still a vehicle. It sells an engine in it. The engine is slightly more efficient than it was 20 years ago. Uh, but the vehicle has more enhancements to just make the job of the driver easier. So you have lane assistance, you might have uh, blind spot detection, um, you might have adaptive cruise control in some much nicer vehicles. You might have the quote autopilot that drives for you and can switch lanes and all that fancy stuff. And that's an example of just technology making things slightly easier for humans uh, we're starting to see this with ai and i think like we're at the beginning of the ai revolution and i'm not sure what that's exactly going to look like in the next five ten years but i think a useful example of practical ai and technology might be the the form of assistance it would be great if i had an assistant on my phone and i could ask my assistant to book me a haircut for next uh, Tuesday. That's something I could do. And it's easy enough to make the phone call, look at my calendar, find out if my barber is available at a certain time, get it all set up. But it'd be even easier just to ask my AI assistant to go do that for me and then add the event to my calendar when it's all book said and done. Um, I think we're going to start seeing more and more cases like that where the just daily things that humans do that are that uh, cumbersome <laughs> to to accomplish that we put off just because we don't want to do them. Uh, we're going to see technology start to step in and take a lot of that stuff off of our plate. Um, I don't necessarily want to see AI take everything. Uh, there are still a lot of things I enjoy doing myself, but it'd be nice to have AI take care of a lot of the just mundane stuff. So as a software developer, as a logical thinker, uh, understanding 20 years of technology, what is going to be after 20 years with AI? Oh, I have absolutely no idea. Uh, we like to see this future where AI is doing everything, right? And all all we have to do is exist. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. I I I think there's still I think there's still things that AI won't be able to accomplish well. Uh, there's still going to be room for trades. Uh, there's going to still be room for for software developers and for architects and stuff like that because people still have to build and maintain the systems that run the AI. Uh, I don't think we want to put ourselves in a position where the AI is managing the AI. That movie has never ended well, so <laughs> we don't want to go in that direction. Um, I also think in 20 years, I'm not going to care because I'm going to be retiring and <laughs> I'll just watch everything from the side. But, um, I don't think we can just close our eyes and say AI is not going to be an issue. Uh, I think AI is going to be a big issue for people going into software development now. 
and wanting to be around in the next 20 years. I just have no idea what it's going to look like. Uh, I hope it's as easy as I can just talk to my phone or the implants in my head. I, I don't know, but being able to tell a computer somewhere to go do work for me and then tell me when it's done, that's, that's a future I could look forward to. So you yourself are a business owner and uh, you are helping uh, different businesses uh, with the technology uh, skill set that you have. So yeah. how you are able to connect uh, that business requirements with the technology skill set that you have and the technology tools and services that is there in the market, which you are working for Microsoft and also you are into uh, uh, you as a, you are you are very good in understanding Microsoft uh, products and services. You have you have yeah. been Microsoft uh, most valuable professional from long time. Uh, well, so it really depends on what the problem that the business owners are trying to solve. Um, rarely is it a case of I'm coming in and doing something brand new. Um, usually it's more I'm coming in to support a system that they already have. And we try to figure out if there's a way to make those systems better. Um, the how to pull in the de- different technologies. I usually reserve that I don't try to pull in different technologies. I, I, I believe that there's a, a tool for every job. And I think there's a lot of folks out there that try to make their tool work for every job. And, uh, my, the software I build, uh, I, I'm very conservative about it. I'm very boring about it uh, because I don't build software that needs that's going to be rewritten in a year. I write software that needs to survive 10, five, 10 years. And when you start doing that, you start to be a little boring about your tech stacks. And that's fine. Maybe I, this is where AI is going to help, right? Where I could write it in a boring tech stack or a more exciting tech stack. And then AI will just rewrite it for me every year or two and keep it up to date with whatever's new. Um, so, yeah, that's probably the best way that I answer it is I I'm boring, but I'm also it's dependable and it's going to last for years and years to come. So how you adopt to the constant change that is happening in the world? I, I ignore a lot of it. Um, it's it's fun to to watch, to observe, but it's a good practice to not react um, because there's been a lot of there's been a lot of technology that has come was pretty to look at. Everyone said this is the next big thing. And then you never see it again. Um, and like we like there was a heyday where everyone was writing flash applets and uh, they were writing uh, server light apps. And then that market just went away overnight and no one was doing that work anymore. So it's good. I think in, in my opinion to just kind of take a step back and watch and see what people are doing and don't follow the trends. And it's fun to follow the trends just to play around and see what's going on. But I don't make long-term decisions off trends. I, I kind of watch or what's um I don't, I make sure what I'm doing is going to last for the next couple of years because we don't have the time, money, or resources to change with every new trend. And uh, how you are able to be successful as a people's person? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, successful as a what? As a people's person, as a public speaker, or uh, hmm. as a consultant, or uh, as a as, as a person who is directly interacting with the businesses. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think I'm successful as a, as a public speaker and a business consultant just because I'm a, I'm a personable person. Uh, I, I enjoy talking to people and, uh, a big part of that is just smiling and relating and being able to have a conversation. Not everyone can do that. That's that, but that is a skill I've, I've had to build over, uh, years, years and years. Um, I, that's, that's really just the secret to it is 
learning how to talk to people. And if you can master that skill, being a consultant, being a public speaker is really easy. So talking with computer or com- talking with the, uh, human, which one is easy? It's easier to talk to the computer. Um, the computer does exactly what I tell it to do. The person, I need to ask the same question three times to get the answer I need. So eventually technology is for human beings and uh, the software that you are writing for different businesses are for users. So how do you... How do you write a software or work on a software with the period of experiences that you have? How important the user's experience of the softwares that you wrote? Uh, the user's experience is really important, uh, but there's there's a, a caveat to that. It depends on who you're writing the software for, uh, because, and I see this often, is that there's this, segment of the industry that's user experience designers and they want to build uh, good user interfaces and experiences for people but there's times where they don't understand the user that they're talking to Uh, there's still a good amount of the industry just business industry that still works off uh, mainframes and green screens and they're very boring interfaces but they're not designed to be pretty they're designed to be functional and there's there's stuff I work on that if I showed it to you, you go, that is the ugliest interface I've ever seen. And I would tell you, yes, it is. It is extremely ugly, but it is functional for the person who's using it because there's a lot of software out there, and especially business software, where the people using it don't care what the colors are. They don't care that you have rounded corners. They don't care that you have transparencies and gradients. They just care box, 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 button, check box. And they need to be able to jump quickly between everything over and over and over and over again. And they don't want to, they don't want to sit and wait on stuff. They don't want to scroll. Uh, they just want to be able to get the information that they need or put the information in. Um, and that's that's one of the things you learn just from talking to people is that they might not necessarily care about that sort of thing. Uh, so the the experience is I need boring and I need it now. And uh, tell me about uh, you as vice president of uh, .NET Foundation. Oh sure. Uh, so the .NET Foundation is uh, a nonprofit organization that is devoted to supporting the. Uh, .NET community um, in terms of open source meetups and people. Uh, so it's been around for a decade or so. I've actually lost count of how many years. Uh, I was elected to the board of directors last year, and I was voted the um, vice president at the same time. But we're trying to help grow and maintain the .NET community uh, because one of the things when you talk about Microsoft, you don't really relate that to open source and to uh, open software. And there really is a very large community of people writing open source software on top of .NET. And we just try to support these folks the best we can. And uh, tell me, you as a chief technology officer for Shows on Sale. Yep. So Shows on Sale is my uh, customer where we build um, tools for ticket brokers that I spoke about a little bit earlier. Um, Chief technology officer is just the the fancy title I carry around, but I manage uh, a team of seven people um, working on a variety of different tools and different products in inside of our suite. And uh, tell me you as a, a owner, trainer, and consultant for SwiftKick. So SwiftKick's my company. Uh, I've, I've done a little bit of everything. So not just the consulting, but there was a period of time where I was actively doing um, training for different companies. And so I, I called it this bespoke training. We would go hand in hand with a customer, learning about what their teams needed and building customized training specifically for their teams and then delivering it. Um, so uh, 
That was something I used to do. I haven't done training in a long time. It's not as exciting as it used to be. COVID didn't help any of that industry. So uh, I left it on the LinkedIn, but I don't do it actively anymore. And uh, Griffin Consulting. Same thing. Also Same company. company. Yeah. Great. And, uh, and also tell me you as uh, president of uh, Revolution VA. Uh, so Revolution VA is my nonprofit organization. Um, we do various software development conferences in uh, the state of Virginia. And most importantly, we do a Revolution Conf. And we have another conference called Hampton Roads Death Fest, which is happening on May 31st. If anyone out there is in the area and they would like to come attend, uh, we have tickets on sale for that. Um, but that's just an extension of what I of my own public speaking. I enjoy public speaking. I enjoy building experiences for developers to come learn from each other. And Revolution VA is just an organization I can do that under. And uh, multi-threaded income is your podcast. What is it about? That's right. Yeah, so multi-threaded income is a podcast I started uh, several months ago. And as a independent consultant, I, I try to be very... Uh, income focused. So being able to ensure that I never have just one form of income to to support myself, to support my family. And I started the podcast to talk to other developers like me who are doing multiple things, whether it's a full time job and building courses or full time job and they're doing freelance work on the side or they're working as an independent consultant for multiple clients. Um, there's a lot of different ways in tech to make multiple threads of income. And overall, we're just trying to help people build financial independence. Uh, we're in a part of the industry now where people are being let go from their jobs every day. I, I think just last week we had some big layoffs. A week before that, there were some big layoffs. And there's a lot of uncertainty in the industry. And there's a lot of skill sets that are just sitting there waiting for someone to hire. And what we try to do is we try to give technologists, but mostly software developers, the tools that they need to go off and just find their own work and not necessarily depending on a day job. So as a business owner, uh, you you will be interacting with uh different different business uh, leaders so what what size of businesses that you worked for oh uh, uh, all sizes so um the client I'm working for right now shows on sale uh that's a four person owner four owner business um just four people four people myself and uh we have a development team but i've also worked for fortune 50 companies uh harley davidson's a good example um where there's a lot of money and a lot of people involved in the process. Um, I much prefer working for the smaller businesses. So how is uh, how is uh, how different it is working for small and big businesses? Uh, small businesses, you can you can get to the answer quicker, um, and it's less less formal. Um, I can send my client a a text message and I can have a response within two or three minutes. Uh, the larger customers, I have to send emails. I have to set up phone calls. It could take a couple days to get an answer to a simple question. Um, and my small clients, uh, smaller clients, uh, I can usually get answers to questions in minutes. So can I say you have understood more about business than technology? I have a I have a healthy uh, respect for for both. Uh, there's there's a there's still a lot for me to learn in business. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say I know know it all. Uh, I am I have a healthy respect for it and I'm willing to learn as much as possible. And it, I also understand not every business runs the same. Uh, everyone has their own own way of running a business, um, and it really changes the bigger that the business gets. Um, software tends to 
stay pretty static. I mean, it's changing all the time in different ways. But if you, again, take that step back and you're a little bit boring about it, it stays pretty constant over time. So how you are able to adopt yourself from one project to another project, which is completely different from what you have done already? It, ask me that one more time. Uh, the project that you have done right now, you know, uh, is completely different from the project that you are going to do, you know, after this. So how you are yep. able to shift your mind to that project? And that it's not easy. Yeah, it's not easy at all. Uh, it's a, it's more about setting my my headspace when I sit down with the project. Um, I don't take a lot of projects. Uh, usually at one time I'm only working with two, maybe three customers at any given time. I much prefer just working with one or two. And it, it's kind of for the, what you were just talking about. I don't, I don't have the mental energy to swap between all these different projects because they all have their own certain language. Uh, I talked about earlier, um, and just way of doing things. Um, I also don't do short, short engagements. Uh, there's been a couple of times where I've tried to do a short engagement for a day or two. And turns out I'm not very good at those because it requires a lot of mental energy to come in, learn everything, and then you're just done. You're, you move on to something else. Um, the, I can swap mind context easily now just because every client I have at the moment, I've been with for years and it's easy to make that jump between them. Um, much more easier now than it was years ago when I started with all these clients. So you, you have two, two companies. You're, you're the owner of two different companies. So have you worked same, for other countries? Yeah. It's same company, two names. Okay. So you worked for other countries as well? Uh, no, the, just, well, um, yeah, it's just my company. So, uh, my company, so I have two names. In the US, we have this, uh, thing called a DBA, do business as. So I have my boring name, which is Griffin Consulting. And then I have my fun name, which is called Swift Kick. And anytime I do, uh, marketing or promotions, I always do it as Swift Kick because it's, a uh, it's a more exciting name than, than Griffin Consulting. Um, but it's actually, a good point. The, the bigger the company, the more formal the company, uh, I will use Griffin Consulting instead of Swiftkick because it's the more boring name and tends to work better with the larger companies. Uh, Swiftkick works better with the smaller companies who are a little bit younger and just trying to, to find someone to help them. I mean, uh, do you have clients from other countries? Oh, uh, no, not at the moment. Uh, I have in the past, um, mostly uh, Europe, but uh, it's been a while. I don't enjoy doing those, that work either. Okay. So at last, uh, can you share your uh, you know, uh, social media presence or people who wants to take your service from anywhere in the world or yeah. else, especially from US? Can you share your presence and your websites or main thing sure. where they can able to see your work? Uh, I'm primarily on Twitter and LinkedIn, um, both places I'm at one, the number one, Kev Griff. And I also have my website, consultwithgriff.com. And those are the best places to find me. So I'll share those links in the description also in the, on the screen as well. And also on my website as a people who find this video anywhere can able to see your work and can able to uh, work with you. Absolutely. And uh, at last, what is your observation about my work? Have you seen any videos of mine on YouTube? Uh, I I have not. Sorry. So uh, I, I'm actually, uh, I've done master's in software engineering and also bachelor's in computer science and engineering. Right now I'm doing some DevOps engineering projects for, for a UK company and a US company. So that is my full-time job. So apart from that, I'm ex interviewing experts like you who are already in the industry and who are working for businesses and who are from different parts of the world. More than 100 countries experts I have interviewed 
and more than 750 interviews i have done for my podcast so in last uh, three years and i have uh, sponsors for my us uh, sponsors from us uh, you know two software companies are sponsoring my podcast and also there are a couple of companies uh, which have the role to be sponsored so as an expert as a person who is into technology from long time we saw the evolution and saw the constant change and who, who is very good in understanding uh, technology products and services and also you who, who is a public speaker and who also have a great uh, uh, engagement with business owners and understanding their uh, business needs and architecture and you know uh, that environment how just talking with uh, you know i i i interview business leaders ceos cfos ctos like all kind of business owners also i interviewed uh, the vice president of amazon web services like a lot of people you might have not seen my podcast actually if you see you you will find a lot of different uh, experts from even from microsoft a lot of microsoft mvps i have interviewed yeah. also uh, a lot of uh, experts from netflix amazon like everywhere so what is your observation how this people skills in me is going to be helpful in my technology career and my personal development uh i i think that you can learn you can learn something from everyone um the one caution i would have is everyone has a different experience different experience a different journey that they, they're going on and it's unlikely that your journey is going to be the same or parallel someone else's journey um and we see this a lot in business where someone will give advice and at the surface it seems like good advice but what a lot of people leave out is that there's a tremendous amount of luck and um and just time pl- being in the right time and right place for for things to work um so i think it's great to have conversations i think it's great to learn i i think networking is extremely important just knowing people um and more importantly not <laughs> not you knowing people but people knowing you is more important uh that that will always pay dividends in the future um i can look back on dozens and dozens of relationships that i've built where the person knowing me has helped me tremendously i i will actively promote my friends and people i know in the industry when i see uh the right right thing pop up at the right time uh and my friends do do the same thing uh i'll get cold emails all the time from someone connecting me with someone else just because i built a good rapport with them over the past um so i i think that's the the biggest thing to concentrate on is doing this sort of thing just meeting people meeting people and maintaining relationships so don't make it a one time we had a chat and then we're done um a relationship requires at least six interactions before someone even really starts to remember your name um and can put your name and your face together uh and just and it's exhausting keeping up with with all the different people uh but that's the part i think that makes makes this really worthwhile is you you have the conversation but then f- having the follow up and continuing to just see where people are over time that's what's that's what's really meaningful and you'll get the most benefit from that is not even going to be so much what the people say definitely i'll put your words in my mind uh, and uh, carry this you know, all my life Uh, so can i put this video on my youtube channel with your permission yeah absolutely and also can i put this audio and video clip on my podcast website internet social media everywhere with your permission absolutely so thank you very much again kevin for your valuable time and sharing uh, uh, some of your experiences and uh, answering to some of my questions oh it's my pleasure thanks for having me thank you sir again take care all right take care cheers bye